Welcome everyone back to uh, the criminal law. In this lesson what we're doing is continuing talking about the idea of the actus reus of an offence, talking about the concept of criminal conduct or criminal act itself, but we're going to be shifting our focus ever so slightly to moving away specifically from a positive act which is committed, which can give rise to criminal liability, to the general rule that is established for an omission to take place. Um, so whereby we have an omission which gives rise to criminal liability instead. So we spoke briefly about the concept of criminal liability being something that can arise in certain circumstances out of either an act that is committed that's relatively uncontroversial. If I, for example, go and uh, commit murder, I go and do an act that uh, I intentionally kill somebody, uh, then that is obviously murder. Uh, the same can be said for things like sexual offences as well. But there are also different rules and liabilities that can exist for individuals who have omitted to perform a certain action, which gives rise to criminal liability. So we, we noted that it can be described in a way as almost the failure to act in a particular circumstance. And it is in that circumstance that we can see criminal liability arise out of an omission. We're going to take a more full and comprehensive study of that particular issue in this lesson, talking about the law pertaining to omissions. And then in the final two lessons on the actus reus of an offence specifically, we'll talk about causation and we'll talk about how causation operates within the criminal law. So we already know what an omission is. Now let's just think about the general rule for how omissions can be applied, or, or at least the, the examination of an omission, uh, which would be, as applied, um, create or negate criminal liability. So the general rule is that and in the criminal law does not criminalise the failure to or the lack of an action in a particular circumstance. So the bar is essentially a little bit higher for omissions versus for acts. There isn't this criminalizing of the failure to do something in all general circumstances. However, this does not mean uh, that criminal law doesn't criminalize omissions entirely. There are omissions where, you can, where there is criminal liability. It just doesn't criminalize omissions in the general form. There are a number of reasons why this is the case, why it is the case that uh, the criminal law should not be seen to just uh, perform a, uh, an over, uh, overarching criminalization of the failure to act or the lack of an action in a particular circumstance. In some circumstances, for example, it may be difficult, nigh on impossible, to even prove the causation. So when we think about an act itself, there's a lot more of a clearly established causal link that you can really that you can really find between an act committed and the crime that is that that is identified. But when it comes to an omission, then it's a little bit more difficult. And so as a result of which if it's difficult to prove the causation from a failure to act, then it therefore means that it is difficult to prove any kind of potential criminal wrongdoing. In a similar way, it also seems to violate the general principle of autonomy, which is respected in law generally, uh, respected th that we have, uh, as autonomous individuals, the ability to make decisions about what to do in a certain particular circumstance. So to suggest that to uh, fail to do and to perform an act in a particular circumstance gives rise to criminal liability would seem to be a violation of this general principle of autonomy. It would also be very difficult to uphold and enforce a general rule for omissions which criminalises any conduct which pertains to a failure to act in a particular circumstance. And so the general rule that we would identify is that there is no criminal liability for omissions. However, when we have a look at the various exceptions to this rule, we can see where the bar is set and where the standard exists for this particular area of law. So there are exceptions to the rule of omissions, such that a prosecution may be able to show criminal liability for a failure to act if the following conditions have been met. Firstly, it has to be shown that the offence in question um, is 
uh, able to be committed by way of an omission. So there are some offences that just cannot be committed through omissions. So robbery, for example, is cited here on the screen. But murder, on the other hand, could be committed by way of omission. So we have to have the right offence to begin with. And if you were doing a problem question, that is probably the first place that you would begin. You would read the problem question. You would look for the failure if there is an omission in the, it, 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 as an issue. But then you'd have to think, well, what is the offence in question? Is the offence in question capable of being committed by way of an omission? If it's robbery, then the answer would be no, and there would be no liability. Uh, it doesn't even necessarily make sense to suggest that uh, there could be liability for someone failing uh, to do something which leads to a robbery taking place. But on the other hand, of course, some very key examples that we're going to see in the future, in the, fu in the rest of these uh, slides, uh, relates to murder, for example, or manslaughter. So the second question is, assuming that we have identified an offence which could be capable of being committed by way of an omission, we then have to show that the defendant in question had some kind of legal duty to perform an action. This can either be a common law duty or a statutory duty or even a contractual obligation in some potential circumstances. So we will get to, in future lessons, things like gross negligence and gross negligence manslaughter. This can be done um, where there is a legal duty for the defendant to perform an action. A lot of these things take place in medical cases, for example. And then we have the third uh, requirement, which is that the defendant had this legal duty, but then breached this legal duty by failing to act in the way that they uh, were uh, legally bound to uh, do. And that this failure to act can be shown to have caused the harm in question. OK, so. You might think that this is quite similar to uh, identifying causation and to identifying uh, identifying liability in negligence cases, in either gross negligence cases within the criminal law or even just negligence within the law of tort. There has to be some kind of legal duty, there has to be a breach of duty, and there has to be causation. And that's it, it is similar in that regard. Um, but of course, we're not talking about an act, we're talking about an omission, the failure to perform an act, which gives rise to criminal liability. Now, let's cite a few examples in the case law. Now, this is a non-exhaustive list of cases that we can think of. Um, some of these are particularly uh, landmark cases, so are very important for you to understand. Some of them are relatively recent, some, uh, recently as well, and so also have um, some kind of relevance to you as well. So the first is this 1977 case of Stone and Dobson. The facts of this case are as follows. Uh, it involved two defendants. Again, we have two defendants, D1 and D2. D1 was the sister of the victim, and D2 was the partner of D1. So we have uh, the sister and the si uh, uh, and then we have um, the sister's uh, uh, partner, uh, uh, and they were both. That is how they had a relation to the victim. The victim themselves were anorexic. And as a result of which, they had refused to eat. They had, they had, they suffered from uh, the, the 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 eating disorder, which is anorexia, and therefore refused to eat. As a result, now the victim had also, it should be noted, been under the care of both the defendants for two major reasons. So, firstly, uh, they had voluntarily taken up the job of caring for the victim, uh, and also the victim was living in their house. So, we have a proximity to the to the victim in the sense that they were both living, or, or sorry, all three of them were living in the same house, but then they had also voluntarily taken up the job to take care of the victim. The Court of Appeal held that there was therefore a duty of care owed to the victim on the parts of D1 and D2, uh, such that when the victim died, the pair were convicted of manslaughter. So there was a legal duty to, to, to act in a particular way, which would be in a way to ensure that the victim did not die of uh, anorexia, and that this was breached from uh, as a result of their failure to act in that particular way and that that failure to act in that particular way causes the harm in question causes the victim to eventually die from their condition and so as a result of which you can see here that criminal liability does arise in the case of a failure to perform a certain action therefore the failure to um, to, to do something an omission in 1983 we have the case of miller this was a case which highlights the fact that liability may arise in circumstances where the defendant created some danger and then fails to act accordingly to try and prevent said danger. 
So the facts of this case are quite interesting. The defendant was a squatter who had smoked a cigarette uh, in the premises in which they were squatting and then proceeded to fall asleep. He, When he woke up, he noticed that a fire had, um, had started as a result of his lit cigarette that had not been put out properly. And so at the moment, at this point, okay, there isn't necessarily in and of itself a uh, an indication that criminal liability may arise out of these facts. But what follows is where the criminal liability comes from, because the defender did not take any precaution or measure in order to try and put the fire out. Uh, and so as a result of which, the House of Lords made it very clear that, they, that the legal duty to act had been instigated at the point when the defendant had woken up and then realised that there was a fire that had been taking place as a result of his own actions. And so any uh, ordinary circumstance uh, in that particular regard would suggest that the defendant would probably act in some kind of way to try and put the fire out, maybe call the fire brigade, do something in that um, to, to, try and, um, to try and reduce uh, the, 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 the damage that was caused by this fire. But given the fact that the defendant didn't do anything, they just got up and left uh, by all accounts, um, then this was considered to be a breach of this legal duty to act. Uh, the defendant was under a duty to act in such a way as to try and prevent or extinguish the fire. Now it should be noted that if the defendant was um, if the defendant wasn't particularly successful in doing so, um, this doesn't necessarily mean that criminal liability automatically exists there as, as well. Um, it is the fact that they had this duty and they didn't do the thing that they were supposed to have done. And that's where the, uh, the liability arises out of this omission. In 1993, we have the case of Bland. Now, this was a case involving a Mr. Bland who had been seriously injured in the Hillsborough Stadium disaster. For those of you who are too young and do not remember the Hillsborough Stadium disaster, um, Google it. It's, it wasn't a particularly um, uh, nice event that takes place. And in fact, we're going to get on to looking at the, the Hillsborough disaster when we do the law of tort and we talk about secondary victimhood within psychiatric injury because there's a case that comes up in that uh, regard as well. So Mr. Bland had been in a... Uh, persistent vegetative state since the accident and the doctors who were looking after him believed that the right course of action and the best interests of the patient would be to remove life support and allow Mr. Bland to, 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 to die. Now the solicitor for Mr. Bland argued that this would be murder by omission and it would also represent a breach of the doctor's duty of care. Because, of course, they have a doctor will, will, will recite a Hippocratic oath to protect and to try and preserve the lives of, of anybody um, who, they, uh, who fall into their care. But in this case, they were making the argument that it is actually in the best interest of um, the patient and the right course of action to allow Mr. Bland to, to, to die. Now, when the case reached the House of Lords, um, the, the appeal would be dismissed and it was held that the removal of life support and the withdrawal of further care would be an omission, but it would actually be a lawful admission, uh, omission sorry, under the general rules that the doctors were acting in the best interest of the patient. And Lord Goff actually argued that by simply omitting to provide care, the doctors were acting lawfully. But by acting in a way which would bring about the end of Mr. Bland's life, by actually doing an act that would kill Mr. Bland, this would represent uh, euthanasia. And of course, euthanasia is unlawful in the United Kingdom. In 1979, we have the case of Crown and Datham. Uh, this was a case which involves a duty uh, on the part of a police, uh, a police officer and the failure to perform that duty, which leads to a particular harm and therefore misconduct allegations made as a result of the omission. The police officer in question had witnessed from around 30 yards away a group of bouncers who had beat up an individual in the street, essentially. This individual was allegedly causing trouble, making uh, making uh, some kind of noise or, or, or essentially causing some kind of trouble within the nightclub. They were removed by this group of bouncers and the group of bouncers, in fact, uh, had beaten this person to death uh, after they were ejected from this nightclub. And they had done so uh, in full view of this police officer who had witnessed it from around 30 yards away. The police officer failed to do anything about it 
and so they were convicted of the common law offence of the misconduct of an officer for failing to perform an action in this particular case. Finally, then, we have the 2020 case of Crown and Broughton. Um, now, this is a case which involved uh, a, a Mr. Broughton, who was the defendant, who was a rapper who had supplied his girlfriend with some Class A drugs while at a music festival. Now, in addition to the supply of drugs, uh, the uh, defendant had claimed to have altered the drugs to potentially increase their effects. Um, this is considered to just be a, a, an additional um, factor within the facts of this particular case. When the victim had then began to take an adverse reaction to the drugs and began to um, convulse and, and collapse ultimately, um, the defendant didn't alert the relevant authorities or even call for help in any way. Instead, what the, uh, the defendant had done was actually just film the victim and then spoke to her parents about what was happening. So rather than calling uh, an ambulance, rather than calling some kind of first aid individual at the music festival in question, he decided to film the victim uh, and then also speak to her parents about it, uh, who uh, allegedly, um, and on the basis of the facts of the case, were pleading with the defendant to call an ambulance. Now, according to expert medical testimony during this case, if the defendant had gotten the victim seen to at an earlier point, then there may have been up to a 90% chance that the victim would have survived. So time was really of the essence in this particular case, uh, such that if the defendant had actually acted swiftly in, uh, in, in calling the right authorities when the adverse reaction to the drug was taking place, then there was a very high likelihood that the defendant, uh, sorry, that the victim, sorry, was actually going to survive this particular overdose. And so as a result of which, and the, the lack of the omission to actually perform in any kind of way, it was held that the defendant would be convicted of gross negligence manslaughter for his failure to act in the given circumstances.